In this video, I'm going to discuss cameras in more detail. So far through this video series, we've just used the default PERSP camera for rendering, for looking at the scene, and so on. You can actually create more than one camera at any point if you want to. To do that, you just need to go up to a Panels menu in one of the View Panels, go to Perspective, and go to New. When you hit New, you get a brand new perspective camera. And the view of that particular view panel will change the new camera. In this case, I have a brand new perspective camera, and it's called PERSP1. My simply numbers the cameras 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The brand new camera comes in off of the angle relatively close to zero, zero, zero point. And here's that brand new camera. Now, once you have a new camera, you can move it like any other camera. You can move it, rotate it, scale it interactively with your transform tools, or you can use your Alt key in your mouse buttons through the view of the camera itself to change the view. The nice thing about having more than one camera is you can use them for different tasks. For instance, I can go back to my regular PERSP camera here. If I go back to Panels, Perspective, PERSP, and leave this as a rendering camera. In other words, I'll set it up where I want it and then not touch it. And in fact, the PERSP camera right now has a resolution gate turned on, which is a good indicator that I want to render that. What I can do, though, with the new camera is go to some other view panel, go up to Panels, Perspective, and switch to that new camera, like PERSP1 then look through that new camera. I can use that new camera just to look at my scene. For instance, if I want to look at different parts of the model to update the model, if I want to just fly around so I can move parts of the environment around, I can use this new camera basically just for working tasks. By having that second camera, I don't have to ruin my good rendering camera. So even though I move this new perspective camera around a lot, it doesn't affect PERSP at all. So it's a good habit to have two cameras in your scene as you're constructing the scene. Now, once you have a new camera, you're free to delete it or rename it at any time. For example, I still have PERSP1 selected, so I can go up to the channel box, click this top cell, and rename it. I can also delete it if I decide I don't need it any longer. You can go into the hypergraph or the outliner and look for its node. Any new camera will come in towards the end. In fact, there's camera 2, which I just named. And if I want to, just get rid of that. Now, the camera I made is a one node camera. As you saw in the hypergraph, it has a single node. There's a couple other variations of cameras you can create, though. In fact, you can create a camera up here at the top under Create Cameras. And there's three main camera rigs you use for normal work there's camera, which I just created, one node, camera in aim, which is two nodes, and camera aim and up, which has three nodes. They're just slightly more complex to give you more options. You can do everything you need to with just camera if you want to. You can also try some more complex ones. For example, let's try a third one, camera aiming up. I'll go ahead and click that. This particular camera, when you use the Create menu, is set at 000. And in fact, it has a camera body and also has a look at control. Here's the body right here. I'll go ahead and move that aside so we can see it. There it is right here. It also has a look at, which is right near this light right here. I'll move that light aside. Here it is right here. You can move that. There's also an up. I'm going to go into the hypergraph to get that. And while we're at it, we'll look at the camera nodes. Now, there is a bug in my it sometimes doesn't show all three nodes. I'll try the outliner this time. Our outliner is a little bit more reliable. In any case, here's the new camera I made. It's actually underneath a group node. Then there's the body itself, which I just moved around. There's the aim, which is that end dot that allows you to point the camera. And there's the up, which determines if the camera is rotated. In fact, my camera is kind of on its side right now, but if I move that aim up above the camera, the camera straightens out. So you can see here's the body. The up is this little circle at the top, and the aim is down here in front of the lens. So this gives you a few more controls. You can either animate all these separate nodes, or simply use them to help position your camera. And having the look at or the aim is kind of handy because it allows you to rotate the camera just by moving this dot and you can place that dot at something you want to look at. Once where you want to look at something, then you can just grab the body and move the body. And you see the camera rotates around that aim or look at point. So this is a three node camera, just a few extra parts. Now again, you don't have to use it, you can use just the regular camera. In fact, you can always just create cameras up here through the panels menu to make your life a little bit easier. 
So let's talk about camera options in more detail for a particular camera. Now, any given camera has a set of attributes. And you can change those, though. You don't have to live with the defaults. For example, if I just go ahead and delete this camera and get rid of it, I'll go back to the outliner, pick that camera group here and hit delete and get rid of it. If I go back to just my perspective camera, right here, I can go to its attribute editor through the view menu. So I can go to view, camera attribute editor. And here will be a number of attributes for any given camera. The most important one is probably the focal length. Focal length measures the lens of the camera in millimeters, and it tries to equate itself with real lenses used in the real world. If you use a video camera or a still camera, they'll have a lens with a particular millimeter reading. That might be 35 or 50 or 75 or 100 and so on. We have the same control here, and every single millimeter you pick has a slightly different effect on the view. If I go ahead and maximize this window, we'll take a look. In fact, I'll go ahead and dolly into my character a bit. For example, if you have a low number of focal length, it creates a fisheye or very wide angle view. In fact, once I switch over to a wide angle, the camera looks like it's further away. Now, the camera didn't move initially, the lens just changed. But then if I dolly the camera in closer, you'll see that it gets some distortion where everything looks like it's far apart. That's a fisheye effect from a very wide lens. It's like looking through the peephole in your door. If I go even lower, like five, you'll see that the feet get really stretched out. So very, very wide lens, one has a very low millimeter number, gives you a bowed or fish-eyed or distorted effect where everything looks really far apart. Now you don't have to go that low. You can go, say, 25, but still it makes everything look a little bit farther apart. Now if you go to a high number on focal length, like 100, it becomes more like a telephoto lens, where it's if the camera is zoomed in. And again, I'm not initially moving the camera. If you change the millimeter, I'll do it interactively here. As you change the millimeter, the view changes simply because of the optics that are being reproduced. Your camera's not going anywhere. Your body of the camera is in the same place. Your lens is just changing. So obviously different millimeter lenses affect the composition. Now, if you're on a film set or a video set, the cinematographer or director of photography would pick different lenses for their effect and how they look on the person or wherever they're shooting. Once you start adjusting the focal length, you'll start to get used to the effect it will have on your scene. Because if you do pick different millimeter lenses, you might have to reposition your camera to make sure you do maintain your composition. In any case, the lower the millimeter, the more wide angle, the more fisheye, the higher, the more telephoto, the more zoomed in. Now, whereas the fisheye makes everything look like things are far apart, like this, where everything's kind of stretched out, a high number, like a telephoto, makes everything look like it's close together. In fact, if I go really high, it'll feel like everything is almost on top of each other. This is a very, very long lens, 1,500 millimeters, but it looks like those chairs behind the man are almost on top of each other, so close. So telephotos will make everything appear flat and close. But the short of it is, just remember to adjust this. You do not have to live with the default setting. You should go ahead and adjust to try different values until you get a look that you like. So that's the focal length. Below that is a near clip plane and far clip plane. This is a great thing to use for modeling or just reference. What it does is clip part of the scene and throw it away temporarily just in terms of what you're looking at through the view panel. For example, if I set the far clip plane to 10, what happens is anything beyond 10 units from the camera is hidden. So that's why those chairs in the background went away. If I set it to a lower number, like seven, it actually clips into the character. So seven units from the camera, which is halfway through the character, is clipped and tossed. If I go to six, for example, even more is clipped. And in fact, if I move my camera, the clipping plane is fixed compared to the camera. So as the camera moves, I start to lose my character. And that can be great for, as I said, modeling if you want to just temporarily hide part of the scene so you can concentrate on a little small area. You can also go from the opposite direction. You set the near clip plane to a value above 0.1, like 5, and then set the far clip plane to a big number again. What it does is clips from the opposite direction. So right now it's saying I do not want to see anything unless it's in between 5 and 1,000. So therefore anything between 0 units from the camera and 5 units from the camera is thrown away. That's why the front of the character is clipped off. In fact, it'll cut right to the geometry. 
Again, this is non-destructive. The geometry is not being affected. It's only the view panel view. Now, if you want to return to normal, simply enter 0.1 in near clip and in some very large number in far clip. And therefore, you're guaranteed to see pretty much everything in your scene. So it's great just for reference for modeling or just looking at things in a narrow fashion. Below that area is a film back. The film back section or the film back rollout is designed to reproduce the optics of very specific motion picture cameras. Now, originally, Maya and his predecessor, Elias Power Animator, were created for visual effects. And therefore, often it was important to match the 3D in Maya to film that was shot in location. And that film used a very specific camera. For example, you can recreate a 35mm Academy camera right here. Now, as soon as you change the camera, in fact, the view will update because every single camera has different engineering, different optics. And so the way light reaches the film is different. So anytime you change the camera, the view will change. Now, if you're simply doing animation for the sake of animation where you're not matching any kind of footage, you don't have to worry about this at all. However, if you did wind up at a studio where you are doing visual effects, you'd get notes from the set about how to set up this section so you're matching a very particular camera. When you match that particular camera, you're guaranteed your 3D fits into the scene much better. So for now, though, we can just leave it at set the user. So those are some important attributes for the camera itself. In a different video, we'll talk about motion blur and also how to bring in image planes.